and Buena Vida Hospice. Uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is Daniel Medrano, Dr. Medrano. I'm also obviously with Canamid Rx and Buena Vida Hospice. Okay, great, great. Yeah. And just, you know, tell us what your company does. Oh, I'll let you start. Me? <laughs> um, can I see it? Hang on. Hang on, Catherine. I'm so sorry. So I do want to thank Catherine um, with Fine Houston Senior Care and also Care Partners for inviting us. We're really super excited. Um, so we're really excited about talking about Canamed Rx. It's a physician clinic here in Houston. We are actually the first physician clinic entirely standalone. Um, legal medical marijuana was recently it was, <laughs> was um, recently proposed to Texas. The Senate Bill 1535 was just approved, um, how long ago? Uh, about two months ago. Yeah, two months ago. And so Canamedrx was um, essentially created to give more options, not only to our hospice community, but our but the city of Houston entirely. So for hospice patients and non-hospice patients, I'm real excited to have Dr. Medrano on board to be able to speak about the benefits of this medical product, medical medicine, actually, um, because it is bringing a um, difference to the community from a hospice and non-hospice perspective. So, um, you know, let me turn it over to him if you guys are ready or. Yeah. Um, sure, go ahead. We'd love to hear more. Okay, sure. So what, what's relevant to, you know, to the conference at hand, you know, our senior citizens is the fact that uh, medical cannabis can be used for many of the diagnoses that they already suffer from, right? And we we stumbled upon it because we are um, very passionate about hospice and palliative care. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was to, um, to kind of break the mold, do something more revolutionary in the hospice arena than was being done already. And so we started exploring medical cannabis here in Texas, which I found out as a physician you know, many of us docs don't know anything about it. We don't know what we can do, can't do. Um, you know, a little historical background, uh, medical cannabis in Texas roughly started in 2015 uh, when it was approved for uh, epilepsy and tractable seizures. But back in 2015, you needed two doctors to uh, qualify a patient for that medication. It was mostly pediatric patients. And, uh, and it was really just limited to that neurological diagnosis. And then roughly in 2019, the uh, Texas legislator opened up the diagnosis that you can use medical cannabis for, and it started including things that were more prevalent in our community, especially our, our senior community. So that include, included um, ALS, Parkinson's, vascular dementia, neuropathy, Alzheimer's. And so the diagnosis codes opened up for the use of medical cannabis um, to include patients that we see a lot in primary care, I, myself as an internist definitely what we see in the hospice world. And so it, it, it just kind of lit the light bulb for Melissa and I to go ahead and open a, not only a hospice that also provided medical cannabis, I believe the first in the mm -hmm. state, you know, it's on our website, uh, but also an actual medical cannabis clinic that prescribes medical cannabis to non-hospice and palliative care patients. So you don't have to be a hospice and palliative patient to get medical cannabis. In fact, Starting September the 1st, what, maybe two weeks from now, mm -hmm. PTSD and all types of cancers will be covered under medical cannabis. It used to be only terminal cancers were covered, now all types of cancers. So let's think about that for a minute. So we're talking about all cancers here. We're talking about melanoma. If you have squamous cell cancer, if you have, you know, a low key cervical cancer, something that's not terminal at all. If you have symptoms that can benefit from medical cannabis, you'll be able to get a prescription for it. And so now the realm is opened up, right? We, we are able to cover our senior citizens and then a grand majority of the Texans who qualify now are, you know, you, you can qualify a pediatric for autism and epilepsy and go all the way down to a hundred year old and cover them with some of these diagnoses. Absolutely, that's wonderful. Now you brought up something, I was getting ready to ask a question and you kind of addressed part of it. 
you talked about people with vascular dementia and -hmm. people with Alzheimer's. That was going to be my question. Can they, and how does that work? And, and how does it benefit these type of people? Right, right. Great question. So we, we do have patients with Alzheimer's on medical cannabis. Mm-hmm. You know, as, essentially what it does is it, it provides a calming effect, uh, especially the agitated Alzheimer's, agitated dementia. It provides uh, comfort for um, their agitation, the insomnia they, some may suffer. You know, the classic, my, my father's getting up at two in the morning to wander the house. So it addresses those symptoms. Uh, it addresses, you know, paranoia perhaps that we may see. Uh, we do have a patient, a great example is when we first started, um, you know, early 2020, we had a, a patient of ours who had dementia and was on your typical dementia meds that doctors, unfortunately, us prescribe, you know, your Ativan, maybe Haldol, maybe something, uh, something like Seroquel. We were able to take this gentleman off all of those medicines. And all he uses now is his tincture of marijuana, uh, which, is, uh, which is essentially an oil twice a day and doesn't need any of the other medicines that could possibly have side effects, contraindications, maybe cause them to be even more of a fall risk. And so by switching them to just a tincture of marijuana, you solve some of the problems of trying to take some of these uh, senior patients off so many of their medications. So you brought up a good good thing there, uh, good information. You don't have to smoke it, right? Correct. Yeah. And here in Texas, you're not allowed quite yet. So in Texas, for legal medical cannabis, uh, smoking and vaping are not yet allowed. Okay. Okay. Because, you know, people my age are typically thinking smoking it. And <laughs> right. you know, I, I can't imagine giving my, my mother-in-law or my mother a, a joint to smoke. So, right. uh, you know, it, it's good to know that medical marijuana is a little bit different. And uh, it's delivered in a way that's comfortable for people, right? Yes. So, yes. so t- tell us about, um, and, and please, anybody else out there that wants to ask questions, jump in. I just have a head full of questions <laughs> and things that I want to ask. We love questions. We love <laughs> questions. So just to kind of touch up on that, Catherine, there you cannot um, smoke it. There are currently over 20 different types of uh, potential possibilities. So basically, once Dr. Medrano um, recommends or prescribes the actual medicine, it then would go to a dispensary of choice. There are two dispensaries in Texas. Um, and basically, it's if you would think of a pharmacy, right? And so the dispensary is like a pharmacy where um, the patient would then say, you know, here's my script. And the, the pharmacy would say, um, okay, here are the options. So there are things such as tinctures, gummies, lozenges. Um, there's 20 different products currently. And one of the dispensaries is actually working on 20 more new products. So hopefully by the end of next year, even sooner, there'll be more products available for choice. Um, we're really excited just to kind of touch back on. Um, Canamed as as a company, Canamed RX in Houston, we've built such a platform that we do offer, um, as Dr. Medrano said, medical, legal medical cannabis, it starts from pediatric all the way to end of life. So we do have pediatricians on board for, um, you know, the community, the city of Houston, uh, as we, as it's known, Dr. Medrano covers the entire state of Texas. Um, but we have pediatric, oncology, you name it. We have those physician partners um, relationships with different specialties. Um, even though Dr. Medrano is internal medicine, which is in essentially entire body, uh, there are some people that, you know, have a cancer. They just feel more comfortable, you know, coming to Canamed RX or calling and scheduling an appointment and preferring, you know, their position to be an oncologist um, or the oncologist recommending, you know, medical cannabis to them versus, you know, I wouldn't want a pediatric doctor um, referring medical cannabis to me if I was an adult. So we we have lots of options the way the company set up. Um, you know, we have our website where, you know, it's www.canna mdrx.com. There's a lot of information, you know, people can sign up if they want an appointment and so forth. But 
we really want to bring exposure and just knowledge to the community, to the city of Houston, for the entire state of Texas. We have patients in FAR, Texas, Marfa, Texas, San Antonio, Corpus. Um, a lot of what Canamat Rx does is telehealth. So, um, you know, a person doesn't actually have to come into the clinic. They can call and schedule a telehealth appointment. Um, one important detail before we do forget uh, is that currently insurances are not identifying um, medical cannabis. So it is private pay, although the prices are not that expensive. Um, we do make it uh, easy for the community and the city, the state to have access for it. Um, we're just really, really excited to be able to spread the word and let people know that we are available for their medical needs regarding cannabis. We do have a billboard on I-10. If anybody has passed it, we'll, we'll be running a contest soon on, on how many views that billboard gets. Um, but we're open for questions. I, I really want people to join in and ask the doctor questions because, you know, it's real important from a clinical perspective that he get the information out there. Okay. So we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, let's see. Uh, Lucero Smith says, who will prescribe the medical marijuana in Texas? And I think you've kind of covered that, but we'll go over it again. The PCP or the psychiatrist? Right, sure. So the physician who prescribes it does have to be certified by the state. So the Compassionate Use Program does have a, a, a essentially a registry for these physicians. So let's say the PCP, uh, a, a physician, I'm sorry, a patient is interested in that PCP prescribing marijuana, they would have to register, upload their documentation, their credentials, get approved by the state, and then subsequently um, be able to, to prescribe them medical cannabis. Yes, it could be other specialties besides PCP. It could be a psychiatrist, it could be a hematologist, um, it could be you know, a neurologist. There's a lot of neurologists on that list. Which we have those on board. Um, basically, if, if there is a patient or someone that is interested in medical cannabis, um, Dr. Medrano is the medical cannabis physician. He doesn't take away from being the PCP. Everyone will remain with their PCP. However, that PCP, um, essentially, do they need, I'm going to, I'm going to pick his brain. Do they need a referral, a physician referral to come to you? No, they don't. They, they're free to come to us. Um, all ages, uh, essentially, we just need medical records with the actual diagnoses that they want to be uh, they, they want to be treated for. Uh, what we don't do in Canamed RX is we don't diagnose, right? So if an elderly patient came and said, "I think my grandfather, I think my grandfather has Alzheimer's, can we get medical cannabis?" Yes, you can get it for Alzheimer's, but that diagnosis has to be already already diagnosed. You, you should already have that diagnosis before you come to us. From the PCP. From the PCP. Now, if the PCP is somebody already in the system, then there's no need. But for us, we definitely need medical records to prescribe. Okay. All right. Does that answer the question, Catherine? I think so. I think okay. so. So let's see. We have another one. Um, sorry. Get this back up. Okay, so uh, Eddie Oram wants to know, can you go to the dispensary for someone or must they go to pick up their own medication? Right, so right now the, uh, the two dispensaries uh, allowed to uh, make this medical legal cannabis do have services where they either, either deliver to the patient or they have pickup spots. So our clinic is one of the pickup spots it's out in West Houston. And so let's say the patient is an elderly patient can't go out there. Obviously, dementia, maybe they're bed bound. Yes, what the state requires is the last social, five digits of the social security number of the caregiver is going to go pick up the cannabis and they could do it for them. Okay, great, great. Yeah. Um, so, you okay. know, as far as the dispensary, uh, when getting the prescription filled, um, it's either delivered to where the patient is and or there, they can, we have uh, time slots at our office where it can be picked up. So it can be delivered to our office or it can get delivered to the patient. But there's a legal process in how it actually gets delivered, um, just to be clear. So it can't just, 
going to Austin, the dispensaries are in Austin. So driving there mm-hmm. is, is kind of, you know, um, not, I mean, it could happen, but typically the dispensaries deliver from Austin. So once Dr. Medrano issues the prescription, um, then they will, the person or patient uh, that is getting the prescription will have a scheduled date and time to when it's ready. And so at that point, they can decide either it'll get delivered to their home or their um, facility, or if they're going to go to a pickup site in Houston. All right. So uh, next question. Oh, they want you to spell the name of your clinic slowly and the name of your website and give your phone number. And if you could uh, also type that into the chat. I can do that. I, am I able to, I can show you the website. Can I share my screen? Uh, yeah, absolutely. If I know how to do that, where would I go to share my screen? Down at the bottom, there should be a green sk- share screen. Yeah, I got you. All right. Uh, it's disabled for host disabled. I just added you as a co-host, so it should be uh, available now. All right. Let me pull up the website. So you take it and I'll put it into the chat as well. Perfect. Let's see. Let's see if that works. All right. There's the website. There you go. And uh, I don't think you can see the entire far right. You should be able to see the number, but I'll put it into the chat. So I'm not sure if you guys can see the entire website there. Yeah, there you go. And so the top, uh, the top there is canamedrx.com. I'll put it into the chat in a second for the website. Uh Canna, Canna, MDRX. And then the phone number on the far right. And when people go to the website, once you uh, they hit the get your RX button, they'll be able to register and, and actually get the ball rolling getting cannabis prescribed. Uh, here, let me open up the chat again. Okay, and while you're doing that, there uh, there's another question. What is the average monthly cost of medical marijuana? And how can I, we get a marijuana prescription if under hospice care? So those are two more questions. Yeah, great question. So the average cost, it can be as little as $30 a month, right? Depending on the product. So it depends on the strength, on the formulation. Some of the products are more expensive to make, like the very concentrated tincture. Uh, the most expensive product I've seen that they put out is a very concentrated THC, which is the active metabolite of, of the product in CBD. And that's about 400. I have not yet prescribed that. I don't, I haven't had the opportunity to do that with a patient that needed that much of a, of a, of a punch. Dose. It's a very high dose. So the average patient spends between 30 and $60 a month. Those patients who want two products, one product for the day, one product for the night, they may look at, they may look at about a hundred a month. Now keep in mind, I was, that's not actually too expensive considering that if you go to Colorado, I was talking to a patient who just came from Colorado. Recreational marijuana out there for her, she had pancreatic cancer. She was she was paying about four hundred dollars in Colorado for recreational because she couldn't get you know the medical at that point. So when she came to us and, and told me about it, I told her, no, no, it's not. There's no way it's going to be that expensive unless you need the very high power dosage or much more than we prescribe. So it's, it's going to be much cheaper than if you go to a recreational state like, like California or Colorado. Well, and also think about um, the cost is minimal compared to if you can, if the medical marijuana can help eliminate another opioid or another type of medication, those other medications can be costly, even with the um, copay or uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, any any type of copay, just medication in general can be rather expensive. So if you have a patient that's currently spending, you know, three hundred dollars, two hundred dollars a more a month, and they're taking, uh, you know, five or six different meds, if you know it can get reduced. Not saying that we're making promises that that can happen, but there are opportunities where the medications can be reduced, which also does help a reduction in their cost. And as we all know, I mean, seniors live on a budget every month. It's minimal. It's a really tough situation um, for seniors to have this minimal budget and, and go and get medications. I know that Dr. Madrano can concur when I say um, there's a lot of seniors in this 
city of Houston that actually go without medication just because they can't they can't cover the cost they can't afford it and so if there is um, a possibility for them to qualify for medical cannabis um, the cost can be minimal typically you know we I, I let everybody know there's low medium and high dosages you know the ranges are anywhere I mean, he could say 30 bucks, but I always just say anywhere from, you know, 75 to 300. Mm -hmm. When you go the highest, I mean, that's, we have plenty of patients with different types of diagnoses. Even when I think about our um, most pain, uh, you know, multiple cancers end stage, they still haven't reached that super high dose of medical cannabis. And so, you know, it it really all kind of goes back to, the patient, um, the quality of, of their diagnoses, the different types. We've worked with diagnoses across the board, um, in stage CHF, cancers, you know, like we said, there are pediatric patients. Um, what are the other diagnoses that we mainly see? Uh, Parkinson's, Parkinson's, seizures, mm-hmm. spastic- spasticity is a big one for those patients who suffer from, let's say you have a herniated disc, you have neuropathy with spasticity. You know, you don't have to be an end stage neuro neurological um, mm-hmm. diagnosis to qualify. Neuropathy is a big one for our diabetics, right? So if you want to get off the gabapentin, you want to get off the lyrica, perhaps then that's that's a, that's another option for them. Yeah, and of course Alzheimer's. I mean, that's that's a common. But the the quality of life that we've actually seen um, bringing back, kind of just. Let me pause for a second, if I may go back. Um, With medical cannabis, and I'll say from a hospice perspective, because we also do own Bueno Vida Hospice, um, both companies were created at the same time during COVID. I I don't know who does that besides us. Um, From scratch, both companies were created, you know, gone through survey, approved through state. the, the purpose of the medical cannabis was to bring quality of life, not only to the patient, but also to the family. Because if you have a patient that is feeling better, you know, they're, they're not walking around with pain or just overdosed or, you know, sleeping a lot, um, appetite's poor. We've seen an increase in quality of life throughout patients, rather you're a pediatric patient, a 20 year old, a 30 year old, or even, you know, in our scenario, um, regarding from the hospice standpoint, you know, in their seventies and eighties, they've had, um, you know, a little bit of increase of appetite, their moods are better. They're not just sleeping. They look better, you know, but from a hospice perspective, it doesn't take away their their diagnoses, their terminal diagnoses. It, it's not curing them, but it's definitely bringing quality of life to the patient as well as the family. Um, and with that, I'll go into the PTSD coming September 1st. Now, I'll let Dr. Medrano uh, elaborate on that. But when we talk about quality of life for PTSD uh, patients of all ages, please keep in mind, again, it's Medical cannabis is hospice and non-hospice, um, but PTSD is, we actually, both Dr. Madrano and I were a part of the legislation move. We actually fought to get this diagnosis approved, um, you know, from over a year ago. And so we're really excited about that coming on board um, for September 1st. So I'll let you talk unless there are questions in between we'd, we'd like to touch on. I know we're on a time limit. Yes, we do have a couple of other questions if we can get to those. And then I'd love to hear more about the PTSD because I think that affects a lot of people, including Mm -hmm. our seniors. Um, So a question, um, Lachey Dupree asked, are there limits on how frequently someone can receive a refill of medical marijuana? No, there's no limits. Uh, It really depends on the patient and the, uh, the physician prescribing. Okay, so their needs, yeah. And then uh, are patients from out of state able to get a prescription for medical marijuana? They have to be Texas residents. That is is part of the law. So if uh, if they are, they're coming into Texas just to get medical marijuana, they're probably not gonna be able to because when we, uh, when we, when we actually identify the patients, they do need a Texas license Mm -hmm. or an ID or Texas ID. Yeah. 
Okay, great, great. All right, I don't see any other questions at this time. If anybody has a question, you can unmute yourself to ask or you can type it into the chat and we'll get those answered for you. Well, I see that Emily, uh, I think Emily wrote, how, how can we get marijuana prescription if you're under hospice care? And, and so, so that one's a little bit, uh, that one requires a little bit more care because as you know, hospice patients are, that's federal money, that's Medicare a Medicare benefit. Right. And so that Medicare benefit does not pay for a federally still taboo medication. Right. And so what we do essentially for hospice patients is that you, you, you can't pay that, that medical cannabis with hospice funds. The, the patient's family uh, has to pay for it. Okay. A, a question I have on that, if somebody is on hospice, uh, you know, a lot of times they're, they're given really some heavy duty drugs to deal with uh, pain that they may be suffering. I know my mother-in-law was. Um, how, how is this different from those drugs and are there side effects with medical marijuana? No, sure, sure. Def definitely side effects. Every medication, natural or not, is going to have side effects. Um, you know, and, and the typical are going to be lethargy if, if it's given too much, somnolence. Um, some people, although this is yet to happen to us, will get nauseous if, or paranoid if they get a high dose of THC, the actual uh, active metabolic um, ingredient, if you will. But on, on the pro side, we're, well, our hospital patients that we've been able to put on medical cannabis have been able to come off the stronger benzodiazepines, you know, the sedatives, the insomnia medications. And so we find that we get less calls from the families when they're on medical cannabis, less calls about insomnia, agitation, less calls about falling. They're more, for the lack of a better word, they're more mellow. You know, they're just, they're just more mellow. And so they're happier. Their families are happier. And you provide quality of care to the patient, but also to the families, because now you have a patient that is uh, less anxiety provoking to the family involved in their care. Great, great. And I think also too, Catherine, if I may say, um, in case we're missing the question, we, so we are going to be the hospice. Hanamed Rx is the medical cannabis sector. Um, if there is a patient currently on hospice and the question is, you know, how can they get it? It's the same um, process and protocol as, as any, you know, non-hospice, but I would highly, um, say this with, with exclamations is, you know, when a patient's on hospice, their medical director may not be knowledgeable on how to, um, how would you best say this, on how to oversee medical cannabis along with their current medications. So if, if that's, if anyone has questions and, or has someone that is on hospice and is seeking medical cannabis, um, I would say give us a call and we can talk um, separately, you know, kind of just a, a little consult. There's no cost, but just to be sure for their sake, um, right? Because currently one of the other um, programs that we're working on is helping hospices throughout the city of Houston. Um, I know for a fact that I, I could say even less than 10, Catherine, in the entire city of Houston, which is the fourth largest city, right? Um, less than 10 physicians with hospices are approved through the state. Um, we can see the list of physicians approved through the state and hospices are still unaware that it's legal or their, their physicians are not registered with the state and approved, or they're just, there's a lack of, of awareness and knowledge regarding this medication. And so if there is anyone, um, you know, that's looking for hospice or looking for cannabis, I would say give us a call so we can chat because um, one of our biggest concerns is um, someone on hospice getting this medication. And as you know, in the community, say, you know, in, a, in an Alzheimer's facility or a skilled nursing facility, they're living in long-term care, most of these facilities have what we call their house call, their house doctors, right? And so sometimes a nurse practitioner will rush in, you know, prescribe a new medication, maybe miss the fact that, you know, that patient's on medical cannabis. Um, that's, you know, where you can get into a, a problem. 
Um, and so we just want to bring awareness to that and, and let people know that they can call if they have questions regarding that so that we can help best um, create a program or a plan of care for them if they become our patient. Okay, great, great. I don't see any other questions right now. Do you want to tell us a little bit about? There is one okay. more question. Oh, oh you okay. answered it in the chat. Never mind. <laughs> Someone was hoping for you to spell the name of your hospice company, but he put it in the chat. So, and okay. also, we'll put the phone number and the website. Um, yeah, I think the He's phone number is in the chat as well. And that's the, there's, that be, okay, there's the hospice website. Great. And the number is at the very top. And if you, and if you're, if you're curious to see that the colors kind of, we, we played out the same colors between the two companies, the Kenemet RX, Avzi shares the same kind of theme. I'm, I'm a bit of an art geek, so I don't know. I just want to find it. Out. <laughs> it looks great. Okay. This is so interesting. I, I'm, I'm really fascinated with all of this. I, I just wish it would have been here a little bit sooner for some some family mm -hmm. members that I had, but I'm glad it's here now. Yeah, so, for um, sure. So many We've, people. Yeah, and it, it's really cool because um, you know I think there's such a taboo uh, with our age group, like you know the uh, baby boomer population uh, or generation rather. But when we talk to you know seventy year olds, eighty year olds. They think it's the coolest thing. I, they just think that they're so cool when they get it. You know, it kind of takes them back in the day because this was something that was so well known to them when they were growing up. Right. They were comfortable, you know, taking it. Um, they felt good after they had it. And so a lot of our, um, you know, elderly population that is oriented and, and you know, can understand, um, they think they're super cool. And we had one patient actually say, wow, you know, I don't, and this is truth, you guys. She said, wow, I don't have to, to meet my drug dealer in the parking lot anymore. <laughs> and I said, no, you don't, because now it's legal. And she said, you know, one of the coolest things is that she can actually drive from Houston to Dallas and, and it's legal and she can carry it. You know, she's not worried about um, getting pulled over and, and, you know, getting caught with some kind of substance or whatnot, uh, or how do you say it? Controlled, mm -hmm. uncontrolled. Um, and so there's a lot of cool benefits when, when you actually, when it's not such a taboo, a lot of our elderly uh, population has been super excited in getting it. Um, one of our other uh, patients, and these are non-hospice people, by the way, um, one of our other patients said, uh, you know, he said, wow, I can't even imagine my mom smoking a doobie. And I said, well, no, you don't smoke it. But what's what's really cool, and if y'all think about it, is, um, you know, a lot of our population is living longer. So, uh, you know, the hospice age now is, you know, we have before even, and Catherine would know, um, and anyone else on, on, on this chat, uh, you know, a long time ago or several years ago, a lot of the hospice patients were 70, 80 year olds. Now, you know, we're looking at 90 and above and the, the daughter or son is like 70 something years old. And so, you know, that little 20, five plus age difference. It, it's kind of cool because then they're actually inquiring about themselves. And so, mm -hmm. so as, as we move forward with this, you know, new product or new medicine, rather, it's just, it's kind of cute to see, you know, a, a, an adult, a parent and a child both on medical cannabis. And so I thought y'all would get a kick out of that because, you know, the age uh, population now is just it's insane how many people are living longer. It's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, question before we get into the PTSD, uh, what about chronic pain illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, is it approved for something like that? No, no, no. there was, it was a big battle this, this two months ago, three months ago and in the state legislature, they were really trying to push the chronic pain diagnoses to help those people who had non-neurologic, you know, not none of the diagnoses you see 
if you go into the actual 150 plus diagnoses, a lot of those are very, very rare, right? A lot of those you won't, as a physician, you won't see those except on your board exam questions. But um, what we're hoping is that down the horizon, uh, chronic pain will be considered again, roughly in about a year and a half to try to push it forward. But unfortunately not. I've had those questions asked by our RA patients, our lupus patients, our you name it, anybody with chronic pain, because we want to take them off the opioids if we can. But unfortunately, not quite yet. But I think it's coming. Great, great. Yeah, and also consider those patients with chronic pain, although they may feel they don't qualify, really, if, if a physician who is educated in medical cannabis may actually look at their medical records and find that they actually do have a diagnosis that covers them. For example, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, that patient may end up having something like uh, spasticity or neuropathy, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Or like my mother-in-law had severe rheumatoid arthritis that caused her a lot of pain. And she also had dementia, vascular mm -hmm. dementia. Exactly. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, you know, you could come in with the point of origination is what I would say. Um, you know, the, the big... Uh, you know, pain factor or, or whatnot. But when the physician looks at the entire picture, you know, there may be something that can be connected or used otherwise. Absolutely. So tell us about PTSD, because this is a new diagnosis, I think that that you're now mm -hmm. able to cover. Yes, yes. And on September the 1st and after PTSD will be covered under medical cannabis. Uh, plenty of research that shows um, that it is effective in treating PTSD. Uh, we, we've been actively pursuing uh, the veterans part of it. You know, the, the, our military have a lot of PTSD sufferers. So we've been making some inroads and trying to get some relationships fortified with those guys so that we can help them out. But veterans is just a, a small sampling of PTSD. PTSD is going to occur with, as, as you may or may not know, any traumatic event. Mm -hmm. You know, that could be... You know, I had I had a patient here about two weeks ago who is in her 60s who Harvey, Harvey itself, the event caused PTSD and she suffers from it. And now every time it rains at nighttime for a long period of time, she gets the PTSD symptoms, right? Anxiety, tachycardia, you name it. And so she would be a perfect candidate for it. Um, and so PTSD is going to be covered September the 1st on, on forward. And as long as that patient has that diagnosis, we can start using that medication for it, the medical cannabis. That is great. That is really going to be helpful. Like you said, PTSD, we tend to think of military and mm -hmm. veterans and things like that, but it, it really runs the gamut. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many situations that you could have been in that could have caused a PT, PTSD diagnosis. Uh, you would have to get a diagnosis first though, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, once again, it's, it's getting... You know, it's getting that diagnosis. A lot of the therapist, therapists can do it. You know, psychiatrists, a PCP can do it. They can diagnose it. It's not a, it's not a magical diagnosis that we can't, uh, you know, we can't actually put into effect. Uh, but yes, uh, if, if, if they're going to come to us, uh, Canamed Rx, we certainly would want documentation of the uh, diagnosis. Okay. All right. So they what? need to really go to their, their primary care physician to get a diagnosis. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So, or the it therapist, right? It starts. It starts there. That's always a good start. And and to be fair, you know, a lot of these docs, many of these docs are not going to know what they're talking about. A lot of these docs, we we don't get trained in medical school about medical cannabis. What we're trained in medical cannabis in school is that marijuana is Schedule One. It's illegal. You cannot prescribe it. And so that sticks with us. It's it did with me up until three years ago. You know, I used to snicker at, at my patients that came in using CBD, and now after being educated and my eyes are open, uh, good CBD, right? CBD that's good quality does help quality of life. And so we're not taught that as physicians. And so we need to be, we need to open our own eyes, be more accepting of something that we were taught was taboo and illegal. And so some of our patients may bump against uh, doctors that are not comfortable talking about it, dismissive about it. Send them my way. We'd be happy. Our team of doctors would be happy to deal with that. We'll be happy to, uh, to prescribe the medication if it qualifies. Yeah. And just to be clear, Catherine, a, a physician referral to Canamed. So 
a physician referral, a PCP doesn't, you know, if you want a referral, what would be an example of referral? Some doctors have to refer um, to a specialist. For cannabis or extra medical cannabis, we don't need a referral from a doctor. So if someone has a PCP and, and you know, that PCP just, you know, turns the other way, doesn't really want to get involved or, um, you know, have anything to do with with the medical cannabis, anyone can come or call our phone line or the clinic or whatnot. We medical cannabis in the state of Texas is not physician referral to physician. It's just from community. And as long as the documentation justifies, um, you know, the doctor, such as Dr. Madrano or any physician that's approved by the state of Texas basically says yes or no. Um, but if a physician referral is not needed to, you know, inquire about medical cannabis or to come to us, it's basically you walk in and see if you get approved or not. I'm sitting up, you guys. I'm just super short. <laughs> I keep adjusting in my chair. It's, it's kind of low. Um, I was going to ask, is diagnoses like anxiety or depression covered? No, not quite yet. But keep in mind, though, um, you know, PTSD, anxiety, it's not the same thing, of course. You know, it goes, it goes back to the symptoms like anxiety, whether or not they're related to a diagnosis that's underlying that can still be treated, right? But let's say you're a healthy 25-year-old and all you have is generalized anxiety, not quite yet. But what would you have? What would you have? Say you're a 25-year-old mm -hmm. and you have anxiety, you're overwhelmed, what else? Could you possibly, what would be a good example um, that of something else that they may have that would? Well, well, that's just it. It really kind of depends on the medical record, right? And so if, if it's in it, let's say it's a, a young man has his anxiety, but it turns out he's anxious because there's an underlying neurological problem, neuropathy, uh, maybe they have ALS, maybe they have what's more common, spasticity. So, so there's always a way to kind of dig through the medical records to see if they qualify. But, uh, but if you had a, a clean, only generalized anxiety, that would be tough to do unless there was an underlying condition otherwise. And what, can you just let them know what spasticity is a little bit? Um, it, it's really general, it's mm -hmm. broad. And so I, I do want him to kind of elaborate a little bit on it um, just because he, as a physician, may know it as spasticity, but there are, it's so broad that you know, when he elaborates, you might say, oh, okay, you know, I know somebody that has this or that. Right, so. right. Sure. And spasticity, which is obviously one of the covered diagnoses, it could be something as complicated as cerebral palsy causing spasticity, or it could be something as simple as that you have a mild herniated disc and every once in a while you have spasms of your lower back, you have spasms of your quads, you know, or, or you had a sports injury or a car accident two, three years ago, and now intermittently you're getting these muscle spasm and spasticity of your muscles. That should be covered. That shouldn't be an issue. And sometimes that can cause anxiety. <laughs> I, I say that because I have a herniated disc in my lower back. And so I, I kid you not, when I'm in pain, what's the first thing we do? We're uncomfortable. I, I can't, I'm really dramatic. So I can't <laughs> breathe. I get like really anxious and frustrated. I, I mean, I'm being honest, you know, it, it's, it's one of the um, biggest things in healthcare is, you know, when you're, when you're not feeling well or you're in pain, that anxiety creeps in, you know, and, and we get short of breath and we get, I get dramatic, but, um, but I just, you know, I wanted him to elaborate on specificity because it's so broad that it can go, you know, from as minimal, which a car wreck is not minimal, but it can go from back pain. There are uh, teenagers, if we look at the pediatric side of it, there are teenagers that, you know, have sports injuries that have qualified for it um, all the way to, you know, elderly um, mm -hmm. population. So the reason I elaborate on spasticity is because sometimes or more so rather we've seen lately that um, people want to get medical cannabis, but they are focused on these big, large names of diagnoses, right? They're, they feel like, hey, you know, if I don't have Alzheimer's or um, something huge of a diagnosis that 
they may not qualify. And so um, spasticity is one of the words that's just so broad that it allows you to basically say, hey, you know what, I'm, I might qualify under that. You know, it, it, in other words, for us, nothing is too minimal or too difficult, if that makes sense. Just, you know, if it's questionable and you're interested, the easiest thing is to just you know, get your medical paperwork together in that way, you know, one of our physicians can take a look at it um, and, and see if you get approved because um, the biggest issue, and, and Dr. Madrano will probably shoot me after this, but one of the biggest things that we've always seen in healthcare is we self-diagnose, right? Or we Google. And <laughs> well, well, I think the doctor will be first to say is, don't self-diagnose and don't Google, you know, let the experts really look at, at the situation. Um, you know, he'll dig deep into that point of origination to see, you know, from, from point of origination, the cause and, and how we can best help. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no self-diagnosing. I have a quick question. Um, originally you said that uh, to uh, doctors needed to give the diagnosis in order to be eligible. Um, is that still the case? No, no, that's a great question. That, that, that's how it started in 2015. And okay. in 2019, that changed. So now it only requires okay. one physician who is registered with the, uh, the CURP program, the, the state program to be able to uh, prescribe medical cannabis. So just one doc. Okay. Right. And here in Texas, we don't have medical marijuana cards. You know, you'll hear that too. California has them, Oklahoma has them. We don't, we don't have them in Texas. You don't have to have one. Uh, so that makes it even easier for the patient. Oh gosh, you guys, I'm so glad that he said that. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I, we do want to let y'all know that, you know, when we've run into so many people, um, there's, I, I don't want to call it a, a scam or a con, but in the state of Texas, you do that doesn't exist. And so there's lots of people that are going online, um, Googling, and, and there's these um, drop lines or, um, you know, taglines that'll say, get your medical marijuana mm -hmm. card, and they're charging you mm -hmm. hundreds of dollars. Uh, and in the state of Texas, th th you don't really need much. that at, at all. So please do not spend money on doing that. Um, that is... I don't know why they're even doing that um, online. That's not the case. It's not true. And once y'all do that or anyone does that, I don't, we don't know where those websites take you or to, you know, if you even, if the person even ends up getting a prescription, but in the state of Texas, you do not need a um, medical marijuana card. It doesn't exist. So please know that, you know, that please don't do that. I'm just, Oh my gosh, thank you for bringing that up because I, I wanted to make sure to let y'all know and let everybody know that um, please don't spend your money doing that. Thank you for that. And guys, I want to thank you immensely for being here today. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Yeah. Um, so it went by quickly. We'll bring you back. I know you're going to be part of a conference that we're having in November <laughs> and uh, we will continue to try and get more information out about this because I think it's very important for people to know. But we do have to close now. Uh, so we'll turn off yeah. the recording. We will. Yeah.